Hello and welcome to this video. We're going to be annotating the poem um, by Denise Levitoff and her poem is called What Were They Like? Uh, we're going to get straight into it today so I hope you're taking notes and highlighting as you go. We're going to move it down and we're going to go straight down to the poet. Now the poet is a very interesting person. As I've been looking into this I've been trying to find out a little bit more about her. Um, so I'm going to start with some notes down here. Now we're not going to have time to do, or space should I say, to do our little sections at the bottom that we usually um, do. I usually break this bottom section up into tone and messages, but we're going to think about those as we go through the poem today so we can use this space for some biographical information. We could talk a lot about um, Denise Levitoff. Um, we could talk about the fact that she is a Brit. She was born in Britain um, to a, w a Welsh woman and um, I think a Russian man um, who was uh, who came to this country um, to flee the conflict during the uh, during the Second World War, I believe. And um, I think I think we could talk a lot about these things, but we're not going to. Uh, she's a very interesting poet. You find out about her if you like. Um, but I'm going to just share with you some kind of common, um, applicable background details at first. So she wrote this poem in 1971. This is really important because in 1971, America, which is where she was living at the time, was in the middle of the Vietnam War. So if you've heard anyone talking about um, Vietnam, sometimes Americans just call it Nam, um, if, they, if they talk about this is this is the time period that they were talking about and the Vietnam War lasted a long time, 1957 to 1975. Those dates are quite easy to remember, aren't they? Look, 5775, so you can try to remember that. So this is right in the middle, well, not right in the middle, I suppose it's towards the end here, but it's right in the middle of a period of political unrest. So, uh, Levitoff um, is writing at this time when uh, there was a lot of political unrest, there was a lot of social change, and... Americans were beginning to question um, authority, questioning um, the individual's role in society. So sort of the individual role in mass culture and how far we can kind of um, go along with these things and how far an individual conscience um, is a is provided as a mechanism for change and social change so this is something that she was really interested in she wrote lots of poems about it essays novels even so she was a poet and a writer. She wanted to be a writer from a really young age um, and she's an excellent poet and an excellent writer. Um, so she did marry an American and they moved over and they lived in New York for a little while um, before they divorced. They actually divorced in the year 1975 at the end of the Vietnam War. Um, but uh, yeah, so she continued to live in America for the rest of her life, um, sort of becoming a citizen as well um, of, of America. So what else can we think of to say about this, um, this, uh, this time period? Well, one thing that's really key to know is, um, if you don't know about what happened in Vietnam, America entered the war later than 57. Okay, the war initially was between North Vietnam, Vietnam, let's get it right, and South Vietnam. So it was between these two, it's like a, you know, a civil war to begin with, between North Vietnam and South Vietnam, but as China supported North Vietnam, America decided to support South Vietnam. And that's a very key issue that we're going to be thinking about in a second. So if they park this thought here, we're going to come back to it when we think about the conflict that's being discussed in this poem in a second. So America entered the war, um, a great big superpower country, 
and it's like um, everybody assumed they'd just wipe the floor with the with the North Vietnamese and it would just all be over and it would be um, easy for them but actually they they lost the war and um, it despite sort of very brutal tactics and um, d different weapons and, and uh, injuries that they caused and and I'm sure they lost lots and lots of soldiers too um, but uh, this this was uh, if you ever heard of the Vietnam War you can't really read very much about it without thinking about this thing called um, napalm which was a chemical weapon um, that was used to sort of burn and incinerate things including people so it was very very brutal conflict and America entered the war thinking they would just crush them but actually they lost the war um, but there was a time of, as, as I was saying, there was a, a time of protest because the American people began to question why they were getting involved in a civil conflict anyway. Now that brings us to an interesting point and I think I've done everything that I need to do about context um, of, this, of this time period. Um, we'll think about the conflict in a second that's been discussed, but something else just to note about the whole poem here. The whole poem, remember written in 1971, I told you this was a really key, key um, year, is significant because it hadn't, the, the Vietnamese War hadn't finished yet. So she writes this poem. The poem is written, um, uh, in response, in protest, to American involvement. So she's writing the poem in order to protest about the American involvement. And in the poem, she imagines, because remember, she doesn't know how it's going to end. She, it's 71, it hasn't finished yet. She doesn't know that America lost the war. She imagines a world where Vietnamese culture and people, where the whole country and the whole people have been obliterated. So she imagines, um, you know, the, the whole poem is looking back on a, uh, on a country that used to exist but that doesn't anymore because they've been obliterated by the Americans in the war. So that's the whole premise of this poem. That's why it's sort of written in past tense. It's as if we fast forwarded to the end of the war and the country's been destroyed and we're trying to remember what the people of Vietnam were like. Hence the title, What Were They Like? So we mentioned down here at the bottom that the uh, conflict is clearly, uh, again, a specific wartime poem. So it's got a very specific conflict in mind. We know, obviously, that it's the Vietnam War. We know, of course, that it's got um, lots of conflict regarding political conflict political conflict in there as well because people were opposed to the war. Let me just move that up. There's also a war going on between innocence and experience. Okay? Innocence and experience. The innocent people being uh, blasted and obliterated and their innocence being completely lost. There's a conflict there between those two things. This is a really clever device that she uses and I'm going to get into this in a second because this is something that we need to come back to again and again. Uh, and there's also conflict in cultures as well. Um, of course, you know, the, the culture wasn't seen as a viable way of life, which is why they needed to be stopped. Now, why is that? That is a really key issue here that I found interesting when I started thinking about this war. Didn't know much about it before I started researching and reading up about it. But very, very quickly, the North Vietnam, as I said to you before, it was a um, 
civil war to begin with. North Vietnam and South Vietnam were um, in, in, in war, in conflict together. North Vietnam, what do we know about them? Well, it was a communist state. But South Vietnam wasn't. And so when America got involved, they wanted to help the capitalist South. But when China got involved, they wanted to help the communist North. Does that make sense? So there's this uh, conflict as well about communism versus capitalism. This is a really key uh, idea here. So I don't think we've got a poem in our collection yet that's got so many different subsets of the conflict that's going on. Let's skip over to this part up here where we look at the form of the poem. Now there is no rhyming, no rhythm, no predictable form at all to this poem, so we call it a free verse poem because we don't have this rhyme scheme. Okay, so free verse poem. Now there are two stanzas, only two stanzas, and in a poem this length, taking up almost the whole page, that's quite unusual, but the two stanzas represent two speakers. So don't imagine now that um, Denise Levitoff is one of these speakers. She's not. She's not supposed to be one of these voices. She's imagining two personas. And so we could even call this form a dramatic dialogue. I'm not sure if I've just made that up or whether that's an actual thing. But if somebody is speaking and, they're, and it's a poem and it's just from one speaker, one voice, one person, it's called a dramatic monologue because it's from one character. Well, why isn't this called a dramatic dialogue? It might be, um, but I'm not sure if I've just made that up. The, pers the persons, the characters, the voices are unspecified. It's not specific people. Let's just divide that off. Um, but speaker one asks the questions in the first stanza and speaker two answers them and we'll see it sounds really simple and it is in a way um, but we'll see a bit more about what that means and how it shapes the poem as we go through okay I think that's all we have to say about uh, these little things here so we come to the title what were they like and I think that this sort of they uh, sort of maybe this is um, evocative of the them us mindset that the USA were famous for, um, and you could argue still are, um, because we've got this very sort of bullish um, uh, questioner that you could imagine being an American citizen of the future, um, sort of just asking some random questions about what the people of Vietnam used to be like. What were they like? And we'll see in this first stanza here that we have this bombardment of questions. Um, it just totally overwhelms the first part of this um, poem. So let's read the questions and then I want you to try and keep up and track how the answerer answers and responds to those questions down here. Let's go for the first stanza. Did the people of Vietnam use lanterns of stone? Did they hold ceremonies to reverence the opening of buds? Were they inclined to quiet laughter? Did they use bone and ivory, jade and silver for ornament? Had they an epic poem? Did they distinguish between speech and singing? So we've got this six questions here, seven I suppose including the title, but we, it's known as the six questions and in some versions of the poem they are labelled one, two, three, four, five, six down here. We've just got the, the line numbers so that's probably why OCR chose to not include them, just to not make things confusing. But ultimately, what can we say about this first stanza? Well there's this bombardment of questions 
from this from this speaker one he answer, he asks all these questions and it seems like um it's from a western certainly a western speaker if not an american speaker okay and i think we could probably say um that it, it it's probably you can make the link here why has she done this why has she created this bombardment of questions why isn't it question answer question answer question answer all the way down well maybe it emulates um, the bombardment of the the weaker country, supposed weaker country of Vietnam, this tiny little country that they thought would just they would just crush easily in the war. Maybe it's just emulating that bombardment of um, of the country there. Um, so so what else is interesting about this first stanza well we've got this um strange like misspelling of the word vietnam it sounds like he's tried to practice saying it did the people of vietnam like a child is asking a question it's not fluent it's broken and an interesting you know structural point here the country is is broken it's broken apart just like she's trying to kind of imagine the country will be broken apart by this war so that's an interesting little um technique there that she's just slipped in on the first line um but also the questions the questioner is ill-informed to begin with it seems to just be asking these questions in a really clinical way. Add up to here if you've got any space. He asks these questions in such a clinical, um, uninformed, almost like shallow way. And most of these questions are so purposeless. They don't have any sort of um, yeah, they're like really naive questions and totally, um, totally meaningless. So, so the questioner is quite ill-informed. Imagine he, he hasn't learnt to spell the country, to spell, sorry, the, the name of the country that he is researching. So the questioner first is really ill-informed. The questions themselves then, what else can we say about them? Well, they're pretty redundant. You know, did, did people laugh? Well, does, does anybody laugh? Of course, there's always laughter in countries. Oh, uh, did they have poetry? Did they know the difference between speech and singing? Yeah, probably. Um, and so the questions seem to be really redundant and shallow um, as we go down this list. Um, the questions are also um, quite idealistic, have this idealistic view of the country, um, which again draws into this idea that the questioner is really naive. Now this is interesting, isn't it? Because we can really kind of go to town on this idea here. The questioner, the Western questioner, this speaker one, seems really naive, seems really ill-informed, ill-prepared. And this again is reflective of the war. How that the, the dominant Western power thought that they would just stroll in there and dismiss the culture um, but but it was actually just the opposite way around um, so actually quite a naive speaker here reflecting the war and the USA how they were quite naive in the um, war in the conflict so this person this speaker is not ready for the storm of answers that they are about to receive. In stanza two, they're just not ready for it. Exactly like the USA in the war, we're not ready for it, okay? 
So that's what I would say about, about that stanza. We're going to come back in a minute and have a look at some of the language devices if we've got any kind of room to do that, um, because there is some sort of interesting bits and pieces going on in there. But I want to get on to the answers, because the answers are the things that really stand out to me as being important. So what I did, um, what I'm going to do to separate my um, second stanza, and the se the, these are not separations that the poet makes, but it helps me just to keep on track with which answer goes with which question. So I'm going to just draw some little lines here. Um, so the first answer is this one. Uh, the second answer comes in down here after line 15. Uh, the third one uh, is sort of like cut in half here, um, it has a little bit of this line here, line 17, and then we go down um, to this one which again does the same thing, it's kind of cut in half. Um, you, could, you could argue this, this part goes with each of them, um, goes with each question. Uh, and then we've got a really long answer, so we've got question one, question two, question three, uh, question four. We've got quite a long answer for question five. There was only time to scream, there was only time only to scream. And then the final uh, answer is this one, question six. Okay, so let's read it through together, just like a poem, and then we'll look into the questions and the answers together. Sir, their light hearts turned to stone, talking about the Vietnamese people now. It is not remembered whether in gardens stone lanterns illuminated pleasant ways. Perhaps they gathered once to delight in blossom, but after their children were killed, there were no more buds. Sir, laughter is bitter to the burned mouth, a dream ago, perhaps. Ornament is for joy. All the bones were charred. It is not remembered. Remember, most were peasants. Their life was in rice and bamboo. When peaceful clouds were reflected in the paddies and the water buffalo stepped surely along terraces, maybe fathers told their sons old tales. When bombs smashed those mirrors, there was only time to scream. There is an echo yet of their speech, which was like a song. It was reported their singing resembled the flight of moths in moonlight. Who can say? It is silent now. A couple of things to go back to up here. The paddies. Um, rice and bamboo, I'm sure you know what these things are, but these are obviously commodities um, grown in Vietnam. Paddies are rice fields, which you will probably know if you do geography, um, but I had to look up. So yeah, this is like the very, very wet rice fields. Uh, they're grown in like flooded fields, aren't they? So the peaceful clouds reflected in the paddies, they're like the water reflecting um, the sunlight. And again, these mirrors is the metaphor here for what a pond would have looked like reflecting. Um, so that's that little bit of context there. I don't think that anything else really is coming up as being um, particularly difficult to access. This reference here about the bones being charred and the mouths being burnt is a, a reference to that napalm um, weapon that was used so to burn people alive basically and scold them and kill them. Um, so we'll go back up to the top and I want you just to keep remembering what questions this, these answers relate to. Did the people of Vietnam use lanterns of stone? Answer, sir, their light hearts turned to stone. It is not remembered whether in gardens stone lanterns illumined pleasant ways. So answer one is interesting, I think, because we've got this formal epithet that the speaker um, of the se section two speaker, speaker two, is using to refer to the speaker um, of stanza one. So sir, we would say, is a formal epithet. It's making this point that whoever is answering is seen as someone who is inferior to the first person. Okay, and we've got this idea again down here, sir, laughter is bitter to the burned mouth. And I think this sort of um, is reflective of quite a, a sort of a common cultural assumption that it's called like the weak east and the dominant west. 
so it's like sort of eastern countries are weaker than western than western countries it's obviously not true but it's this kind of cultural acceptance um that's you know isn't true but it kind of stereotypical um way of thinking about things um that is explored in lots of different uh, literature genres, not just this poem. So it's this formal epithet kind of, you know, reinforcing the, the stereotypes of this weak Eastern person versus this dominant Western person. So the light hearts turn to stone. So we get this image of stone here. We've got lots of interesting images in this poem. We can see that this is all obviously referring to a loss of humanity. You know, their hearts didn't really turn to stone, but maybe they were so, um, I don't know, hard-hearted hard that they lacked compassion. I mean, wouldn't you, if you'd just been set on fire, you wouldn't, you know, it's by, by the way, the, the treatment, the way they've been treated um, in Vietnam. Um, so I'll just move that over there. So they've kind of lost their humanity and they've turned into hearts of stone. They don't have any compassion anymore. But interestingly, we've got this end stopped line here. Um, this is a key little uh, bit here because it's a very kind of forceful, bitter tone to the first question. No kind of like small talk, no testing the waters. It's just a very bitter first line. So this end stopped line gives the reader a chance to reflect on this. Um, really important device used here. It's not remembered whether in garden stone lanterns illumine pleasant ways, perhaps, and then we've got question two here. I want you to get a different colour highlighter because all the way through we're going to track some of these um, sort of these clauses, these phrases that seem to add vagueness to it. It is not remembered. It sounds like they're creating some kind of non-fiction report here. It has been reported, it is suggested, it is not remembered whether. And so we're going to collect these as we go down here, starting with this word in answer two. Perhaps they gathered once to delight in blossom, but after their children were killed, there were no more buds. So they're talking about here about the ceremonies, um, thinking about the blossom and, and how people might have reverenced the opening of blood, uh, buds in the country. Perhaps they gathered once to delight in blossom, but after their children were killed, there were no more buds. Um, so again, we've got this really like end loaded sentence here. It starts off pretty pleasant, perhaps they gathered once to the light of bottom, but after their children were killed, and this is the shocking sort of part of this sentence, and it's deliberately stacked to the to the back, which we call an end loaded sentence for that dramatic impact. Um, it seems to be that, you know, why would their children be killed? It gets us thinking about how surprising that is, dramatic surprising so just like the sentence surprises you so the conflict was very surprising and took that took them by surprise um so question three what have we got uh, were they inclined to quiet laughter which i just think is the most pathetic question that anyone could think of here when we're talking about a country that has been obliterated supposedly and again we've got this um we've got this uh sir Laughter is bitter to the burned mouth, a dream ago perhaps. They're saying, look, there's no one laughing in this country because what have they got to laugh about? We've got again this sort of um, aggressive B sound, we call this plosive, okay? And it sounds like they're spitting as they say it, so it's bitter to the burned mouth. A very, very bitter tone coming out of this line here. A dream ago, perhaps. Building up this collection of sort of elusive, nebulous terms that are going to be important. Ornament is for joy. Well, this is um, referencing this question up here. Did they use bone and ivory, jade and silver for ornament? So this is a classic kind of, um, I'll put a little note in here, it's sort of like rustic crafts 
that were you know shaped ivory and maybe some jewelry and things like that here people jewelry making were they involved in jewelry making again a completely naive question when you're considering what happened uh, in the war and how brutal it was uh, ornament is for joy so people only make necklaces when they're in a time of peace really all the bones were charred and again this image of the aggressive bitter tone super helpful there in just exposing how naive and um, ill-prepared this questioner is for these th these horrible answers that are coming out um, so again we come up to this fifth question and we've got a really long answer to the fifth question had they an epic poem referring to you know what, what kind of culture what kind of poems did this culture enjoy did they tell lovely stories did they all have little songs that they would sing together again a really naive um, idealistic view of what sort of maybe undeveloped country people would do it is not remembered again shut down completely remember most were peasants so we've got this wonderful uh, anadiplosis almost um, combined with the sejora in the middle um, it emphasizes by the repetition of remembered remember it emphasizes the fear of history being lost okay remembered remember it's like that repetition like right? we've got that little rhyme haven't we remember remember the 5th of November it is not remembered remember and again the sejora in the middle combining there to um, to, to, to make you pause and think and, and stop and, and try to reflect on these things most were peasants their life was in rice and bamboo when peaceful clouds were reflected in the paddies and the water buffalo stepped surely along terraces maybe their fathers told their sons old tales we've got a very kind of long sentence for this we've got very very short sentences all the way through and then we've got this very long sentence in the right in the middle of this stanza here uh, deliberately creating um, this um, bucolic image of peace peaceful country being completely ripped apart and I think that's really intentional here that we get all of this um, beautiful peaceful imagery peaceful clouds let's go through and get that get those images there um, in the paddies, the water buffalo stepped surely along the terraces, fathers told their sons old tales, so they're like trying, she's trying to personal, personalise this um, tragedy here. If it's just random people, if it's just numbers on the screen, it doesn't mean anything, but these are families, fathers told their sons old tales. And what a wonderful, um, example of the antithetical parallelism here when bombs smash those mirrors there was only time to scream so we've got the bucolic images of peace completely contrasting with these violent aggressive verbs smashed scream and do you think those violent aggressive verbs would have been as effective if they didn't have this antithetical parallelism, no way. That has been deliberately crafted to create that shock, okay? Just like the shock that the country would have felt going through this conflict. So question six says, did they distinguish between speech and singing? Final answer we've got here on this line. There is an echo yet of their speech which was like a song. We've got some nice, some nice similes coming up. Like a song, it was reported their singing resembled the flight of moths in moonlight. Who can say it is silent now? I think moths in here are kind of like an image of fragility. 
they really kind of seem vulnerable here, just like the people of Vietnam. So they seem this like vulnerable, fragile people because their singing is so delicate. It resembled the flight of moths in moonlight, which I just think is a fantastic image. I can't really put into words why I love that so much, but I just do. Um, but wonderfully, we've got this kind of where the second speaker seems to gather a little bit of, I don't know, like a little bit of strength here and turns round to the sec to the first speaker and turns a question on that person. So we've got this kind of cyclical structure of the poem because up until now, this person, the second speaker, has just been answering questions. But now she turns it back on the first speaker. Who can say? And again, I'm imagining a really bitter tone here to this poem. Who can say? It is silent now. Not allowing any kind of positive message to be taken from this conflict. So if we just have a quick look, so I've forgotten to do it, but when we have a look up at this section, we're tr trying with our, my, I'm trying with my orange highlighter to locate these moments, moments of vagueness in this second stanza. It is not remembered, perhaps, perhaps. Um, where else have we got? It is not remembered. Here it is. It is not remembered. Um, and then maybe fathers told their children fathers told their sons old tales and then again a bit more vagueness down here it was reported we're not sure but it was reported that they're singing there might be there may be more of those things I just haven't found them probably and so I want to try and make a note somewhere on my page here wherever you've got a bit of space because I think this is a really important um, structural well not structural more like language feature that she uses I'm going to make the notes down here um, because I think that this elusive and nebulous, like really hazy, unclear, vague phrasing is really significant in this poem. Because the whole point of this poem is to add this element of we're going to forget about these people because they're going to be wiped off the face of the earth. So doesn't the elusive nebulous phrasing really add to that? I think it gives it a nostalgic tone. So perhaps I'll get my purple highlighter and highlight nostalgic tone. But it also represents a culture being forgotten. So definitely do not have enough space on this page to write all my notes that I want to. There's more we could say about this poem, of course there is. The bit at the top here that I got excited about at the start, the fact that it deals with innocence and experience, I think this needs looking at a lot more carefully because to begin with you think that the Western speaker would be the person of experience and that the Eastern answerer would be the person of innocence. And actually you kind of get it the other way around. The Western speaker, speaker one, the person who asks all the questions, are really naive. They seem to be totally naive. Whereas the second speaker seems to be the person with a bit of um, know-how a little bit you know it's a bit more informed in the first person so i think we get a lot more excited and say a lot more about this but we've run out of time uh, thank you so much for listening and i hope that you've been able to add to your notes on this amazing poem what were they like